Welcome to the Right Time Podcast. The Right Time with Bomani Jones. Welcome back to The Right Time with Bomani Jones. My name is Clinton Yates, filling in here on a Tuesday. ESPN Radio is presented by Progressive Insurance, and all guests on The Right Time appear via the Shell Penzo Performance Line. Want to give me a phone call? 1-888-SAY-ESPN. That's 1-888-729-3776. If you watched the National Basketball Association last night, you saw the Celtics beat the Wizards to move on to the Eastern Conference Finals to face the Cleveland Cavaliers, leaving my Zardos going fishing, as they say on some networks. But the end of the game was really telling for a lot of people, especially John Wall. Now, John Wall coming into this game had gotten a lot of criticism for a lot of, from a lot of people. Obviously, we know the story arc of his career. Dug in before his first game, trying to find a way to make an all-star team. Not necessarily loving the respect or lack thereof he gets from fans, refs, other players in the league, so on and so forth. Finally gets the Wizards through. He has a monster game six. Bangs a three at the end of that game that puts him on the national map, setting him up for a perfect situation to make his legacy something on a national scale to be admired. Then the game happens, and the Wizards ain't got nothing bench-wise for the Celtics, and by the time the fourth quarter comes around, he's done everything he could, and he's got nothing left in the second half. Last 19 minutes of the game for Wall, zero points, 0 for 11 from the field, 0 for 7 from 3. Finished with 18 points, 11 assists, and 7 rebounds, which on its own as a line does not, doesn't sound bad. You know, you think, okay, that's a decent ball game from him. But when you take into account what happened down the stretch, you realize that, oh, man, he fell apart. And there was nothing much he could do about it. We talked to Jeff Goodman earlier in the show, ESPN basketball insider for the Celtics. He said he talked to Marcus Smart after the game, and even Marcus Smart was like, oh, yeah, he, he, he didn't have it. He was done. Reason why, partly, is because of the Wizards' backup situation. They got Brandon Jennings. Scott Brooks didn't exactly manage the men very well. He was running them ragged in the first half. Sure, maybe that's what they needed to stay in the game, but it's certainly not what they needed in order to finish the game. And John just fell apart. He didn't have it with him. I'm not mad at him. He left it all out on the floor, as they say, Shannon. You want to get your cliches in, guys. But I don't think that anything that happened yesterday somehow diminishes who John Wall is. I explained this yesterday. For all these people out here who don't want to say that he's a superstar, who don't want to say that he's an important player in the league or to D.C., you're wrong. You're flatly wrong. John Wall's got his face on the side of Ben's Chili Bowl. If you know anything about D.C., you know that means something. I'm talking on the outside where President Obama's face used to be. He's a big deal. What this game signified to me was that John and Bradley alone can't do it all. It's not going to be a two-man show straight to any NBA title. Even if we lived in some world where LeBron James didn't exist and you could just run your way all the way through the Eastern Conference Finals. But we do. Absolutely. King James is very much the monarch. And so you got to think about this if you're the Wizards going forward. Are you going to get guys around John that are going to allow him to be the point guard you think he can be? Or are you going to consistently make him and Bradley the only real options and thus sort of run them ragged and probably never really make it out of the conference? That was the reality we were facing looking at that yesterday. You might recall game two of that series. It went to overtime. John ran out of gas again. It's like that old joke. Man, my back's hurting. See, you play a pickup against a guy, says to his own teammate, my back's hurting. He says, why? He says, because I'm tired of carrying y'all, which is exactly what's been happening with those two. Shannon, I don't know how you feel about this, but I don't think that this game was some super negative mark on John Wall's overall career arc, even if he didn't put up much at the end of the game. 
It, it was disappointing to watch because you want to see great players play well regardless of the outcome. So, yeah, it was uh, disappear- uh, disappointing. And he'll have, I believe he'll have other chances because I think Washington's still right there in the East. But it's going to be tough, though, moving forward and looking back on his career and not bringing up, well, he had this game seven. He had this chance, though, to really make a mark and 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 get to at least to the Eastern Conference Finals. But let me let me ask you uh, this question: As a Wizards fan, I know you mm-hmm. probably don't really believe in moral victories and all of that stuff. But how much, how differently would you have looked on this season if the Wizards would have won this Game Seven, but still lost in Eastern Conference Finals to the to Cleveland? So, in essence, I'm asking: What yeah. is this season considered a success, regardless of the uh, the loss to Boston? I think it is. I think it is, and we talked to Scott Van Pelt about this yesterday because from a psychological standpoint, I've already taken the step that this team probably can go further. I know we just asked this, how far did you actually expect to go? About as far as I expected to go was getting to the Eastern Conference Finals and probably not doing much, but maybe giving a game or two. People forget that when the Bulls and the Bullets faced off way back in, I think it was 95, 96, The Bulls won that first-round game against the Bullets by, like, a total of eight points in three games. It was back when they had five-game series in the first round. And, like, people were like, hey. It was the the most exciting sweep I'd ever seen in my life. I was expecting something maybe along those lines for this Wizards team. In which case, I mean, I I don't know if that's a moral victory at that point, but it is an advancement from a skills standpoint and from an achievement standpoint. Getting to that round matters. I don't care about this 66 70 seasons garbage that everybody every stat that everybody's talking about about DC. I'm not concerned about it for the numbers and I'm not concerned about it for me. I'm concerned about it for the investment of capital and talent analysis that this franchise has put in over the years. After a while, Ernie Grunfeld, you know, has to look at himself and say, "What am I doing wrong here? Why can't I seem to find the guys to get me over the hump?" And if you're Theodore Leonsis, the owner of that team, you got to say, well, at some point, we're going to have to make some changes here because these guys are too good. Everybody around the league can see that. You go into Cleveland, you bang them out earlier in the year, you play arguably the best game of the NBA season at home that requires a ridiculous LeBron James shot to go to overtime. You've got a squad. You've got to find a way to make this work. We are well outside of the zone of John Wall isn't good enough to lead his team that far. We are well outside of that. And that's what I think last night showed, Shannon. It showed that if he's got to do it all, and Beal as well for that matter. Beal had a great game. Beal had the best game of the, of the Wizards that night. But John, to me, his, he, this was not a legacy changer by any stretch. It's another notch on the book of a season that you're probably going to remember for him hitting that game six shot and jumping up on the scorer's table talking about his city. And don't come to his city dressed like it's a funeral because that's not the move. And I respected that. Yeah, I one of the jo- o- go ahead, go I'm ahead. sorry. No, go ahead. Now, one of the ongoing jokes that we have here on The Right Time is uh, focusing on the relationship between John Wall and Bradley Beal, where you know Wall sees himself as the top guy and Beal more so as a sidekick, whereas Beal sees him as equal. So do you think – where do you think they are in regards to the hierarchy in there? Is, is Wall still the guy and Beal the sidekick, or are they on evil uh, – uh, standing or e- equal footing. And if that's the case, if, if they are equal, though, shouldn't we expect more out of Beal next year? That's a tough question, and I think that Beal yesterday might have changed that balance of power a little bit. Very honestly. Beal had a heck of a game yesterday. I mean, he was filling it up, for lack of a better term. And when John ran out of gas, you know what he was doing? He was coming down the court and giving it to Beal and clearing out. So if John considers him an equal, or at least... When John knows that he can't get it done on his own, the first guy he goes to is Beal. I think at that point, yeah, you are considered equals. And for what it's worth, Shannon, I don't. I get that discussion. I don't really know that it matters because I think part of me feels like they kind of should both feel like they both want to be the guy. Mm-hmm. You know, what I mean that that helps that relationship in terms of output. In my opinion, it might not necessarily help in terms of you know, sort of the, the two of them. But if they're forcing each other to be better, if Beal's got to be the road guy and John's got to be the home guy, okay, you got to cover it. Figure it out. But to me, 
The heart and soul of this team is obviously John Wall. That's what I was explaining to y'all yesterday. Say what you want about the Washington NFL franchise being the most popular in this city. Basketball is the game of D.C. Top to bottom. Amateur, pro, college, whatever. The The cultural sporting currency of the district is basketball, and John Wall is the face of that right now. Yesterday didn't hurt that one bit. He played his tail off. He ran out of gas. That happens. It's unfortunate, and Scotty Brooks has to figure out a way to get a backup to make sure that he doesn't run his tires all the way down to the tread. But if you're asking me, did John Wall ruin anything, or do I think any less of him after last night's game? Absolutely not. John Wall is still the basketball hero of the capital of the United States of America, and that ain't changing anytime soon. Coming up, is Lonzo Ball destined to be a Laker? He is from just outside Los Angeles. We'll talk about that next on The Right Time. I'm Clinton Yates, filling in for Bomani Jones on ESPN Radio. The Right Time with Bomani Jones. Welcome back to The Right Time with Bomani Jones on ESPN Radio. My name is Clinton Yates, filling in here. ESPN Radio is presented by Progressive Insurance and guests on The Right Time up here via the Shell Penzo performance line. Hit me up, one 888 say espn That's one 729 3776 Is Lonzo Ball destined to be a Laker? His dad, LeVar Ball, seems to think so. He told ESPN.com's Ramona Shelburne that in a wide-ranging profile, we're going to talk to her in the next segment. But I'm right now going to talk about my man LeVar and this story that she wrote. And in general, how I feel about the Lakers and Lonzo Ball. Conspiracy alert, Shannon. The entire league needs Lonzo Ball to go to the Lakers. Has to happen. If all this bluster and all this foolishness ends up with him somewhere else, it's going to be awkward, it's going to be pointless, it's going to be weird. If I'm the NBA, I'm making sure I'm doing everything I can to make sure that the balls are in Los Angeles as a market, Shannon. I think it just feels like a foregone conclusion that Lonzo's going to end up with the Lakers, right? It's just like it seems as though everyone has already accepted that fact. Yeah, and that's fine. I, I Look, beyond the fact that I love a good conspiracy theory – I'm sort of fine with the NBA halfway fixing their league. Situations like this, it makes sense. You want this guy in Los Angeles. The story works. We've been over this before. I love LeVar Ball. If you've read this profile, if you have not read this profile by Ramona, you need to do that. LeVar breaks down exactly what his plan was, if you didn't know. And he says a couple of very interesting things as well about who he is. People don't realize that LeVar Ball is not just some carnival barker who happens to have a couple kids who are good. He trained these kids to be good athletes. He works with them. He is a personal trainer by trade. It ain't like this just sort of happened. He tells a lot of fascinating stories about how he trains a lot of different things. Animals, that is, before he had kids and how he trained them, how he worked with them physically. He also says something else. That training is actually his passion. He doesn't even really like basketball that much, but it's his boys who do. And I've said this before, and I'll say it again. If you don't like LeVar Ball, you need to think about why you don't like LeVar Ball. It probably doesn't have anything to do with the fact that he's got a loud mouth or the fact that he seems to be talking about something he hasn't done. A lot of people's feelings about him amount to a stay-in-your-place argument, and I'm not a big fan of that. Because LeVar Ball, frankly, hasn't done anything wrong. Has he made some ill-advised decisions? Perhaps. I've said as much so on these airwaves. I don't think it was smart for him to not let Lonzo get his own shoe deal to start with. LeVar could have started that company on his own and maybe worked it in later. That's my personal opinion. But am I going to knock him for trying to go his own route? Absolutely not. That would make no sense. Why knock a guy for trying to do it on his own? This is America after all, isn't it? one 888 espn That's one 888 Raphael in New York. What's good? Hey, uh, just wanted to comment on, on the whole uh, ball situation. Uh, it, I, I personally feel that he should actually go wherever he ends up. And, yes, his father is doing a good job in, in trying to support him in that and actually st- pave the way. But in all honesty, it's it's kind of like turning teams off, in my opinion, and that could actually even uh, drop his draft stock 
and even trying to even get in like the top five or even maybe even the top ten. Not to say that he's not an athlete that's a, that's a part of that, but it's gonna hurt him eventually. Thanks for the teams phone are gonna call. Turn away from that. I appreciate it, but we don't know that. Have any, has any team come out and said we don't like him? Magic Johnson said that you know, as far as he knows, Lonzo's still up there. And I'm sorry, did I did I did I miss something, or did when Eli Manning say he didn't want to play? For the Chargers, did anybody say that something was wrong with him for that? When John Elway said, he, nah, I'll just go play for the Yankees, when he got picked. I mean, you know, this is not unheard of to want to go a certain place. Don't act like all of a sudden if Lonzo wants to do it or if LeVar wants to institute it, that is some huge thing that's way out of bounds. I'm Clint Yates here, filling in for Bomani Jones. It's the right time on ESPN Radio. Do you want to take seven friends to an NBA Finals game? If so... Make sure that you're listening to Mike and Mike every day this week at 8.45 and 9.45 a.m. Eastern time for your chance to win the Mike and Mike Dream Final Sweepstakes brought to you by Dell for Small Business. Shannon, do you think if Lonzo goes to L.A., that is better or worse for the LeVar brand itself? It's an absolute win for LeVar. It's an absolute win. So in turn, it'll be a win for Lonzo. It's the, the whole thing. We've, we've been talking about the Triple Bs now for quite some time. And then yep. to have them in somewhere like Los Angeles and have them on the, him on the Lakers, and you know Lakers are going to be on TV, thus LeVar and, and the Triple Bs are going to be on television. It's a win. I mean, this guy's made so much money already on advertising alone from us having to talk about it. And we could continue to talk about it because he knows what he's doing. Has some of the stuff he said been absurd? Absolutely. But we're yep. still going to talk about it. This is free This is free publicity and advertising for him. I'm totally here for it. Ramona Shelburne, who we'll have coming up next, talks about this in her story, and I've been talking about it for a while as well. This is the Kardashian model of success. And I am a 100% proponent of of the Kardashian model of success. Don't at me. All right? And don't get mad either when these two families come together in a glorious way, Shannon. It's going to be beautiful. The Baldashians, it's going to be like Game of Thrones. I'm going to love it. But more seriously, when it comes to basketball, the NBA has to get Lonzo in Los Angeles. Magic wants him. People even say that his game is sort of like magic. I'm not saying he's going to come out and start throwing Showtime passes behind his back and all that foolishness. I'm just saying in terms of being a, 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 a pass-first guy who's got an ability to shoot, that was the comparison a lot of people made to him. Magic owns the team. I'm not saying he's going to come down and start scouting him and teaching him how to play like that, but this is a story that the NBA needs. Lonzo has to go to Los Angeles or else this is all a big bust. And nobody wants a bust on draft day. Coming up, we'll talk with Ramona Shelburne, senior writer for ESPN.com, about her Lonzo and LeVar Ball feature. I'm Clinton Yates, filling in for Bomani Jones on The Right Time on ESPN Radio. The Right Time with Bomani Jones. Back to The Right Time on ESPN Radio with Bomani Jones. My name is Clinton Yates, filling in here on a Tuesday. ESPN Radio is presented by Progressive Insurance, and guests on The Right Time appear via the Shell Penzo performance line. And right there... We've got Ramona Shelburne, senior writer for ESPN.com. She wrote that Lonzo and LeVar Ball feature that's got my timeline popping. How are you today, Ramona? Good. How are you, Clinton? You like that Uh, one about the potty training? You did like that, huh? (laughs) Cold behind. (laughs) I know that feeling every once in a while. So there was some great details in there, and in a very obvious way, I think to a lot of people, this story kind of humanized, for lack of a better term, LeVar Ball. What do you think the thing, you know, being with him – what was the most surprising thing to you about sort of his personality once you finally sat down with him? All right, I'm going to tell you a story, Clinton, and mm-hmm. I'm going to pretend like nobody else can hear me when I tell this story, okay? Okay. <laughs> like that we're not actually on the radio, all right? <laughs> so LeVar Ball is a traitor, right? He is like, you know, we all hear him as like, you know, he's just like the obnoxious dad who's like yelling from the stands and like, we stick a microphone in front of him, and he wants to talk all the time, and he always says he's just really good at speaking in headlines, you know, mm-hmm. really good at, like, right, and knowing how to stir things up. But, like, when you spend time with him, you realize, like, his essential nature is that he's a trainer. And generally speaking, like, you know, you might as well be on The Biggest Loser. You know what I mean? Like, that's the, that's the personality type, right? Ooh, it's, not, like it, it's, it's a combination of, like, trainer slash Don King, you know, like right. WWE, like, promoter kind of. So, anyway, 
hanging out. I show up at the house. It's 9 o'clock in the morning. He's got breakfast ready. This is like the second shift. Because he gets up at 5, makes breakfast for the younger two kids before they go to school. And then he makes breakfast for Lonzo around 9. So that's the part where I was meeting him. And okay. he show up and it's like, you know, it's like real breakfast. Like, it's like French toast. And, like, he takes the strawberries and cuts it up into, like, four slices. It's not, like, just, like, one, you know, here's your strawberries. Like, here it is. <laughs> and he's been doing this for 20 years. Okay? This is what this is what he does every single day. And then you go to the and then you go to the gym and work out. And then you come home and have lunch. And they always get Subway on the way home. And then you take a nap. And then you go back out and run. So we're, they, they, they run the hills in Chino, and uh, it's, like, it's just beautiful there, right? Like, in the, in the hills there, like, the, the yellow mustard plants are all over the place, and they're steep. And I'm watching them and everything, and, and I said to Lonzo, I go, this looks pretty hard. This, you know, this hill is pretty steep. And LeVar's like, yeah, you, you can do this. You can run all day because the way he plays, he, can't, he can never get tired, right? And I said, yeah, yeah, is that right? And he goes, yeah. And he goes, I go, is this hard? And, um, and he goes, no, nah, it's hard when you haven't done it in a while, but it's okay once you get used to it. And uh, and, and LeVar goes, you could do it. I go, what do you mean? I, yeah, I, don't, I could, but I don't want to. <laughs> right? <laughs> he goes, right? Do I need to prove anything right now? But now there's like five – there was like five or six guys there. Like they're all on the high school team. LeVar was training like so, you know, a bunch of different guys with Lonzo. And they all started going, come on, you can do it. And I was like, no, I'm okay, I'm good. And LeVar was like, come on, girl, you've played college softball. you got to do it. And I go, oh, man, am I going to have to do this? Oh. <laughs> so I took off up the hill, Clinton. <laughs> wow. I took off up the hill. And he goes, you got to get past, you got to go all the way to the third sign. No no other reporter gets past the second sign. You got to get past to the third sign. I go, oh, man, is this what you make everybody do? Is this like a thing? No other wow. reporter. So I so get you... to the second sign, and I'm dying, right? Like, <laughs> oh, man, that was a steep hill. But you know what? There's LeVar Ball back there just barking at me. Come on, girl, you can do it. You can do it. And I did it. I kept running. And then, I, I mean, I was, like, you know, not wanting to embarrass myself. <laughs> I used to be a college athlete, so I better be able to run that dang hill. Right. But I kind of went, oh, I kind of get this now. Like, that, this, like he's a trainer. He's just yelling at you. Okay. you know That makes sense. Right? That makes a lot of sense. Wow. <laughs> We're talking with Ramona Shelburne. Right? That wasn't like a national radio show that I just told that story on. Yes, you told a story about how LeVar Ball conned you into running a hill in Chino Hills, just for the record. Yeah, we give you yeah. a thing for that. We're talking to Ramona Shelburne, <laughs> senior writer for ESPN.com. The other thing about this story that I think it illuminated me on, it's like just what you just said, is that he, there's a very serious regimen to him. I think a lot of people feel that he's kind of out of control, is kind of a loose cannon. Yeah. But that's not the case at all. This guy had a plan. He had it put in place. And he's executing it pretty well yeah i mean there's like a discipline to it and like when you're out there i mean there's kind of not much to do around there right like it's it's like it's about an hour outside of la and it's like suburbs like tract housing it used to be like you know so it's, it's the kind of place that's like quiet like you know you saw the quote from lonzo where he says i actually like chino better than la you know i just mm-hmm. like it because it's just you know basketball and you know hanging out like it's not like he, he doesn't seem like the kind of guy who's gonna want to go out all the time like he's more of a chill guy right so that 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 fit you know if you just think about the discipline and the regimen he's had these kids on like you know whether you believe him or not and that was the whole thing that i was wrestling with with the whole story and then i said oh i know how to write this it doesn't matter if i believe him you just kind of like you write it like with this bemused tone like <laughs> maybe he's telling the truth and maybe he's just completely full of it i don't know right, right? but but it's kind of funny like if you just treat it with this humor and that's kind of how i started interviewing him right like that's kind of how you talk to lavar like if he says something crazy, you just say something crazy back or you call him on it. Like right. he, you know, we all take him, I think way too seriously. And it's hard to, it's hard to understand him unless you hang out with him. Right. Cause you're mostly just reading the headlines and seeing him, you know, walking in with that big ball of strut, and, you know, <laughs> on all his TV shows. But like, there's a discipline to him. There's been a plan in place from the beginning. Like, you know, he, he thinks he's as a trainer, you know, a lot of being a trainer is having everything figured out. Like, you know, people have to trust you. People have to believe that you know best. Well, he, he definitely thinks he knows best, right? Yeah. Um, and and I think, like, on the one hand, you, you respect the discipline. You respect the, the, the plan, the thoughtfulness behind the plan. Um, no, even down to the even down to this one little detail, like, they didn't play regular AAU ball, right? They had He had the three boys play together. They were, like, 8 years old, 10 years old, and 11 years old, playing against high school kids. I said, what are you doing? He goes, well, one, I wanted to make them tough. But two... I didn't want them playing with a bunch of all-stars. I wanted them playing with kids who weren't that good, so they had to figure out how to win no matter what. 
and they had to figure out how to elevate their teammates. And I was like, oh, that's interesting. He goes, that's why Lonzo is such a good rebounding guard because he was the biggest guy on the team at 11, and he had to go rebound against 15-year-olds, and he, he's a guard. But I wanted him to be a good rebounder, so I put him on the team. I was like, that's interesting, right? Yeah. Like, that thoughtfulness, right? And he goes, and I wanted them to play at the fast pace because you can't beat a bigger, stronger team playing the way they play, but you can beat them if the ball, you know, if you move the ball and play fast tempo and shoot threes like that. Right. And, you know, I mean, it's so weird seeing this, like, 10-year-old kid shooting 35-footers like Steph Curry back in the day. <laughs> you know, but that's how they played. Yeah. She's Ramona Shelburne, senior writer for ESPN.com. ESPN Radio is presented by Progressive Insurance, creators of the Name Your Price tool. Choose from a range of coverage options and pick the price that works for you. I know you got to get out of here, so I'm going to ask you this specifically about the Lakers. I personally would love to believe that the NBA is conspiring to make sure that Lonzo gets <laughs> on that team. But what Just do you ask think? Just man. Just ask LeVar. I mean, I know, but that's what I'm saying. Do you think that it will actually happen? And, like, how good is that eventually for the league or bad if he ends up going somewhere else? Listen, I like a good circus, okay? So, for me in L.A., I'd be just fine with that, right? Because it'd be endless entertainment, right? But And also, like, if you just really look at it, like, he does play the pace that the Lakers want to play. He's an unselfish point guard who actually would probably be a good – compliment with D'Angelo Russell if they if he's still on the team, right, if they don't trade him in, in some kind of other thing this summer. But, you know, Luke Walton wants to play fast. What does Lonzo Ball do? He plays fast. Yeah. You want a point guard who's unselfish. Like, he actually fits what they need now. We don't know how good he is in half court yet, and we don't know how good he is defensively yet because we didn't see that at UCLA. Um, yeah. Those are the big questions with him, and as well as that funky shot that he has. Like, which, by the way, evolved, which this is Lonzo and LeVar both say this, when he was 11, playing against 15-year-olds, he kind of cocked it to the side because he was shooting over taller kids all the time. So that's right. kind of how that shot got weird. Gotcha. <laughs> like, all right. You know, but, well, yeah, like, it would be good for us. We'll always have something to talk about, you know. <laughs> this, this is very true. <laughs> Ramona Shelburne is a senior writer for ESPN.com. She wrote a feature about Lonzo and LeVar Ball, and she also ran the hills with them. Thank you, Ramona. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. <laughs> one hill. I did, I did one. Okay. Talk to All you right. soon. All right. Bye, Clinton. See you later. That's a funny story. I mean, you know, you're hanging right around LeVar Ball. You better expect to exercise. I would believe that. You know, makes sense. And this is my point about LeVar. For all the bluster and all the foolishness, there's a plan there. I like a man with a plan. I hope he's planning to get involved with the Kardashians. God, I hope so. The Baldassians are going to be a thing, and it's going to be the best L.A. story this side of O.J. Simpson. I'm Clinton Yates, filling in for Wilmonty Jones. This is the right time on ESPN Radio. Coming up, are the Celtics really underdogs? Isaiah Thomas seems to think so. We'll talk about that soon. The right time with Bomani Jones. Welcome back to The Right Time with Bomani Jones. I'm Clinton Yates, filling in here on ESPN Radio, presented by Progressive Insurance. Guests on the right time appear via the Shell Penzo performance line. Hit me up, 1-888-SAY-ESPN. That's 1-888-729-3776. We just got through talking with Ramona Shelburne, senior writer for ESPN.com, about Lonzo and LeVar Ball. I just got through letting you all know that I want the Balls and the Kardashians to come together to form like Voltron and make an ultimate L.A. family because that would make me very happy. And I also want the Lakers to get him, and I'm totally fine with the NBA conspiring to do so. But if you haven't read that story, check it out. It talks about how LeVar Ball is actually a pretty disciplined guy. He's a trainer at heart. He's not just screaming and yelling all the time. He actually just wants his family to get on the right routine, to get down their path, to get to, to reach their goals, and he's doing a pretty good job. one eight 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 say espn That's one eight 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 seven two nine three seven seven six. Paul in South Dakota. What's good? Uh, LeVar Ball thing. Like, I mean, I, I get I'm – not, I'm not against him having a loud mouth. I'm not. I get the loud mouth I have on myself. Um, you got to tell the story. You got to be, you know, bolster. It's a very, you know, bold personality when you're in the media. But the thing is, is I don't understand why everybody's saying they don't understand why people don't like him. I mean, first of all, people don't really like loud mouths. I know that just from being me. Um, you know, it, it's it's one of those things where loud mouths in sports it just doesn't tend to work. You know, throughout the history of sports, loud mouths usually, and that's after they make it. Even like you got your Terrell Owenses, you know that you know they they've made it and they're being loud and people don't like that. Lavar being not an not want to say an athlete, but not on a professional team, he you know he's got this loud mouth. People don't like that. Also, it seems kind of like exploitation of his kids to me. I mean, that's really the way I kind of view it. Is it's kind of like self preservation. You know, I'm not going to say he doesn't have credit. Of course, he, you know, he raised these kids. You know, he trained them to be as good as they are. But for me, it kind of seems like what he's doing is using their talent for his own benefit in a sense to where he's kind of putting himself first. And that's just one of the things that I think a common person like myself 
Dusty's first and foremost is he's in the limelight more than they are, like by far. I don't even think it's close. I've seen more and heard more about LeVar Ball than I have of any of his kids, especially Lonzo. And that's, and that's one of the things that I think it, it strikes a chord with everybody. Why is that a problem in your mind? I mean, it's, it's only a problem because, you know, it just seems, it seems like bad taste. To me, personally, I think it seems like bad taste when you use your kids' talents for your own benefit. I mean, it, it, using it your talents like for their benefit. They're the ones playing the basketball, and they're the ones. Why do you think Lonzo Ball is going so high in the draft? Right. No, I agree. I think he's an extremely talented individual, and I think that you know, obviously LeVar has a big part to play in that. But it seems like, he, you know, with the brand and with the shoes and – and and basically always being in the limelight, you know. I haven't, I've, n- I've never heard of this man. I guarantee nobody else has before he, you know, Lonzo was a big deal and started doing his thing at UCLA, and now all of a sudden Lavar is in the limelight more than Lonzo is by far and away, saying ridiculous, over the top things, and I just feel like that's something that he is he's taking advantage of. He's taking advantage of his his kid's success and putting himself in front of that is what it seems like to me. Now, granted, like we were listening to Ramona earlier, you know, you don't know a man until you get to know him, obviously. She's out there. She met him. Obviously, you know, she has a better take on it than what we all think. But that's just what it appears. It appears like he is like, oh, I'm the guy that's I'm, – I'm the one that's doing this, not my kids. That's what it comes off as. All right. Uh, thanks so for the phone call. I appreciate it. That is wrong. Lonzo Ball said two things about himself. Everything else he says – is about his kids. Everything. He talks about his kids all the time. Lonzo Ball was not a non-guy. If you, if, you, if you follow sort of local L.A. stuff, people have known who these kids were since they were at Chino Hills. He moved them all there. He installed the coach. Do I agree with him fooling around with that situation in terms of in-game? Probably not. But to act as if he's exploiting his children makes no sense. He raised his kids he built them up, trained their skills. Now they're excelling. This is not exploitation. All right? Sure, maybe one day they'll say, I don't really love his personality. But in that same story, Lonzo makes it very clear he would not be where he is without his dad. This is obvious. All right? Now you want to know why people don't like him because he's a loudmouth? There's the short answer and the long answer. Some of you might know what that means. I'm not going to give you either one right now. But what I'm saying is that you don't like his personality. That does not equate to him being exploitative. If he's up making two shifts of breakfast every morning, what's he exploiting? Last I checked, that's called being a good dad. Putting food on the table. Supporting your kids. Pushing them. I've said this before. I'll say it again. I love my parents. My parents happened to be divorced. Things were a little tougher in terms of their ability to support. But if either one of them had put the effort behind my interests that this guy did, whoo, I don't know who I'd be. There were things they wanted me to do, and they were very supportful, supportive of that. And I love them for that. But who, who knows how everybody in this world would be if their parents got behind their specific interests the way that LeVar Ball has gotten behind his kids. One eight 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 say ESPN one eight 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 seven two nine three seven seven six. Clinton Yates filling in for Bomani Jones here on the right time on ESPN Radio. Choose Shell V Power Nitro Plus Premium Gasoline for the best total engine protection you can get. It's a touchy subject for a lot of people because a lot of people just can't handle the fact that a good dad is a loud spoken guy who believes in his sons. Let me check in on some other people who have done this. Joseph Kennedy. You want to open up your history books, or as the kids call it these days, Wikipedia. Other people. Gordon Gronkowski. Maybe not as loud, or maybe he just didn't care to be that way. But it still worked. All right? Don't come at me with this stay-in-your-place argument for LeVar Ball. This is the United States of America, where being a loudmouth can get you pretty far. You know what city I'm broadcasting from. Case in point. All right? LeVar Ball is supporting his kids. He's got his son all the way up in the top five. You might not have ever cared about that kid otherwise. You tell me that a guy whose sons have committed no crimes, who all you know them for is being a family and being basketball players, is doing something wrong because you might not like his sneakers or he's going outside of the original and sort of the major lanes to make sneakers that's your only issue with him come on man
do better. Coming up next, Pete Carroll might pick up either Colin Kaepernick or RG3. Wow, I'm Clinton Yates filling in for Bomani Jones on ESPN Radio. Thanks for listening to the Right Time Podcast. Please come back tomorrow for more. And don't forget to listen to The Right Time with Bomani Jones from 4 p.m. to 7 Eastern on ESPN Radio and the ESPN app.